Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. This is Dr. Greer, and I'd like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to bring up to date with what's going on with DisclosureProject.org and CSETI.org and the OrionProject.org. And uh, we have a really uh, good show today just back from Mount Shasta, California, uh, with our senior team and a group of uh, new trainees and had some amazing contact experiences and sightings up on the mountain and uh, in the area. So that's going to be the focus of the show. But uh, And we're going to be joined today uh, with uh, uh, Emery Smith, who's on our senior team and has been doing amazing photography and uh, contact work with us for about three years. So uh, but before I get into that, I want to get into a little a bit of an update on the Sirius film. And those of you who are new to the show, you can go to serious.neverendinglight.com and see what we're doing with this uh, feature film that uh, is being funded by the public through crowdfunding, which is really an exciting at this point. I think we're uh, approaching the number one uh, crowdfunded uh, film of all times. Uh, and uh, this film is going to be about disclosure, uh, contact, new energy, and transdimensional sciences and the science of consciousness. And uh, it's going to be something that really moves the whole disclosure effort and contact effort forward um, uh, from the point of view of the people doing it rather than the government. And I think that those of you who want to help with that can go to that site and find out more. Now, a lot of people have been asking, uh, this is my first interview since the really tragic and senseless uh, shooting at the Sikh temple in Milwaukee or outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, that happened uh, a few weeks ago. And as most of you probably know by now, our, uh, the filmmaker, uh, Armadeep Kalika, uh, his father was the president of this Sikh temple and was uh, uh, tragically shot and killed during that incident in the course of trying to uh, take down the gunman and uh, prevent him from killing other innocent people and in the, in the process uh, gave his life to help protect others, but he did not survive the attack, which of course was shocking. And, and terrible for all of us. Um, many people have asked if this is going to interrupt um, the process of creating this historic film, Sirius. And I just want to let everyone know that we're very much on track with the production. In fact, uh, we just got back from Mount Shasta where we have been able to film a lot of material that can be in this documentary. Uh, and we also have recently concluded meetings with uh, a member of the, the scientific community who is a top geneticist, one of the top geneticists in the world, PhD scientist with a major Ivy League university who is going to be helping with the evaluation of this uh, potentially very important piece of evidence with this uh, biological uh, entity that's a oh, about a six to eight inch long, a small and apparently very young ET body, and this is uh, something that, of course, uh, we've talked about on the show uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, this uh, geneticist who's come forward is a significant addition to our scientific team and is has the most impeccable credentials and is going to be helping us with the uh, genetic studies, uh, both from the point of view of ruling out uh, it being a human known a genetic anomaly or congenital anomaly, uh, but also doing the actual DNA sequencing and comparison uh, of the genetic material from this being. So uh, it's a very significant development, and, and we just completed those. And in fact, uh, in about a week and a half, we're going to have uh, the filmmaker, Arm Kalika, and, and the production team out here in Virginia to uh, go through our archives and meet with our senior team while we do a contact event out here at our farm in Virginia, and also to be interviewing new disclosure witnesses in and around the D.C. area and environs. So the production is moving forward, uh, and we are pretty much on schedule. And uh, I wanted everyone to know that uh, things are really going forward quickly. So this is very good news. Um, we certainly have been uh, given arm Kalika some time to be with his family and as many of you know his mother um, who did survive the attack at the Sikh temple but was trapped in a closet 
he, she was texting Arm during the attack, and um, it, it's been a very traumatic, as you can imagine, and terrible event for everyone who is involved in this act of outrageous and senseless violence, um, which unfortunately has become all too familiar in our country and around the world. But uh, it, they have recently buried, uh, I think it was last week, uh, Mr. Kalika, the, who was the president of the Sikh temple, Arm's father, and um, so we are anticipating everything going forward on schedule, and uh, we, of course, have been sending our sympathy and our thoughts and our prayers to the Kalika family and to all the victims of this outrageous and uh, senseless act that happened in uh, Wisconsin a few weeks ago, and I invite everyone to join us in our thoughts and prayers on behalf of all the victims as well as for Arm Kalika and, and his family who suffered this terrible loss. Uh, there, uh, the production itself is, is multifaceted, as, as you may have just picked up on the fact that we're not only filming new disclosure witnesses and putting together old ones, we're putting together new photographic evidence and, uh, m most importantly, pursuing this piece of very hard evidence in the way of a potential extraterrestrial biological entity, or EBE as they're called, um, that we have uh, previously reviewed. And uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Bra Jan Bravo and myself have uh, personally uh, visited this uh, being um, that's in the possession of an institute in a foreign country. And I can assure everyone there have been questions on my blog about, you know, is it really um, a biological specimen, could it be plaster of Paris, or could it be what have you? And the answer is that it absolutely is a biological specimen. It has a head, two arms, and two legs. It has um, a very unusual skull structure, eye structure, uh, and, uh, and different long bones in, in both the lower leg and forearm, and also a different number of ribs than humans would have. It has 10 ribs instead of 12. Uh, it's uh, incredibly significant if it is what we think it is, but at this point what we're doing is uh, having the geneticists and clinical people rule out any known genetic human defect or malformation that could explain these features, and so far the people who've looked at it who are some of the top people in the world have never seen anything like it. In fact, the response from most of them has been, wow, and that it looks like an ET, but uh, at this point, you know, we're, we're going through a process. We have identified someone who is the top person in the world on skeletal malformations in humans to review um, further x-rays that we hope to be taking when we go to visit the, the institute that has this little beam um, and who will further uh, develop sort of their own study of it from the point of view of the, the anatomy uh, of this creature. Um, and then at the same time, we hope to, of course, get an MRI study that will show any internal structures as well as to obtain some genetic material um, under forensic quality genetic extraction that will lead to um, our being able to run a full genetic uh, karyotyping sequencing of the, of the material from this being and compare it to the human uh, genetic material that is known and in the database since we have now completely run the genetic code for humans, homo sapiens, and, and be able to see what, if any, differences there are. Now, one of the things I want to point out to people is that, as, as you all know, humans and gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees are 98 to 98.5 percent identical genetically. So, uh, obviously, what we'll have to be looking for are the unique markers and given the fact that this is an upright uh, humanoid type being with an arm, two, you know, and two arms, uh, two legs and a head and a spinal column and, and what have you, uh, you were probably dealing with something that's going to have a 99 plus percent identical genetic structure to humans, although this is not known at this point, but it's very, very likely. The question is, are there key markers in the human genetic uh, makeup that do not exist in this being or other markers that exist in this being that do not exist in humans that are at key points. So this is what we're going to be looking for, and luckily we have identified a geneticist, um, as I mentioned, who is at an Ivy League university and is very much at the top of this field um, and has offered his services to assist us in this crucial undertaking. 
And those of you who want to help support what we're doing, because obviously this is a rather expensive expedition and enterprise scientifically, um, can contribute at serious.neverendinglight.com to not only the film, but also this uh, important bit of research that we're undertaking right now. So uh, I want to just bring everyone up to date on, on the film and the work that we're doing and the status of the production and also the status of um, the filmmaker's involvement, which is still going very much apace. In fact, we will be with him here in about 10 days uh, out here in Virginia and in Washington. So uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing him and to moving the, the entire project forward. So that's the update on that. So uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Emery Smith, who's on our senior contact team. Welcome, Emery. Oh, thank you for having me, Steve. So it's uh, exciting. We've just just returned, literally, uh, the wee hours of Monday morning, late Sunday night, from our uh, expedition up on Mount Shasta. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, everyone to uh, go to cseti.org, cseti.org, to see what we do on these expeditions. Uh, basically, we go out for about a week under the stars uh, in various places around the country. We've been going to Mount Shasta since 1999, and uh, we have gone there because we've had consistently a very significant contact with uh, extraterrestrial civilizations and beings in and around that uh, very ancient volcano, which, uh, as most of you know, is about a 14,200-foot volcano that's in the Cascade Range in northern California near the Oregon border. And the Native American people have a lot of traditions of contact with star people in that area. And, and many people, settlers uh, in the early days, as well as Native American peoples, uh, have re records of spotting these luminous light ships that come out of the volcano and of luminous uh, beings that come out uh, that, uh, that then go off into space. And in fact, one of the most important videotapes ever shot was of a Sea City expedition a couple years ago where a light craft lifted up from a field right in front of us and, and uh, sort of went through a series of maneuvers and went out into space, sort of uh, twisting and turning uh, and going in and out of space-time transdimensionally until it vanished into the stars. And actually this bit of footage will be in the movie Sirius that is coming out that we hope in December or January. We hope to have it completed in December. So we go there every year, and of course, those of you who've been following this show uh, know this, but for those who are new, we uh, go there and use a set of protocols, uh, one of which is uh, I developed about 20 years ago uh, when I formed CSETI, and the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence's central purpose, although most people know it for its disclosure project, is uh, to create peaceful contact uh, with these interstellar civilizations um, from humans and to do this openly and willingly and to train many people to do it. And we use a, a combination of protocols. One, of course, is and which is key, and people at the World Pusion Network will understand this, involves the science of consciousness and the very ancient Vedic concepts of, of unbounded pure consciousness and meditation where we go into a deep meditative state and learn to remote view space or the area where we are and see these extraterrestrial civilizations or individuals and then invite them to our exact location by doing coherent thought sequencing where like a laser is coherent light, we create, create coherent thought that serves as a guidance, a beam of thought that guides them right to the location, in this case, Mount Shasta. Uh, and anyone who wants to learn how to do this uh, can do it. There's a, a training kit that's at disclosureproject.org, but also now there's an Android app uh, as well as a iPhone app that's the uh, ET Contact app, uh, and that is available at either the iPhone, iTunes store, or the, the store where you get the Google Android uh, apps for your smartphones. And this app has the meditations. It actually will convert your phone into a magnetometer that picks up magnetic field fluxes as these ET craft or beings approach. Uh, and it's a very, very good tool uh, for those of you who want to try that and uh, have a smartphone. The other thing um, is that we use is that we use high-powered lasers and send up into the sky. The one I have goes two or 300 miles into space, and that serves as a linear vector for the ET craft to see. And we also have um, electronic tones that we've recorded in the crop circles and also during contact at Mount Shasta 
and uh, those we play with an audio recorder and a radio transmitter to serve as a linear vector so that in case our minds are not crystal clear uh, with our remote viewing and imaging through consciousness that they have this as a vector to, to utilize as backup. So all three of these are utilized at the same time, at the same spot, and we have never gone out where we have not had contact. In other words, every single time we've used these protocols, uh, we have had contact of some form or another. Uh, sometimes it's uh, craft that appear, sometimes it's tones that come into the circle, sometimes it's a uh, trans-dimensional uh, entity that is moving around, setting off our electronics and interfacing with us. Uh, sometimes it's a, a remote view that several people get and then is confirmed by something that is physically seen or sensed. Uh, there are literally thousands of ways that we have had contact uh, that are surprised people because they're nuanced and extensive, and this is what you would expect from civilizations that have as their central operating system, as you want to look at it, uh, the science of consciousness, because if you're going faster than the speed of light, you're dropping out of linear space-time, and you're entering into these other dimensions, which are the dimensions of astral thought, uh, consciousness, thought forms, the sound component of thought, uh, et cetera. And uh, this is something that I've written about extensively, and uh, I think that most people the World Puja Network who understand the Vedas and the Sanskrit language as well as the um, the cities, the S-I-D-D-H-I-S, the various capabilities that derive from higher states of consciousness, will we'll understand this. Uh, and uh, I think that understanding it and putting it into application is really what C-SETI is all about, and that's why we go on these expeditions. And um, so what we want to do during this, the rest of this hour, is to kind of bring people up to date on uh, the kinds of experiences we had at Mount Shasta this year which uh, kind of involved all these components, electromagnetic, uh, craft, fully materialized and seen, objects coming from the volcano, et cetera, and so on. So it was really an exciting week. And uh, so, uh, Emery, do you want to share some of the, the highlights of what you recall from things that happened? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, one that comes uh, right to mind right off the bat, there's so many things that have happened that week there was just a phalanx of many different civilizations that we were visited by uh, during the week in Shasta. Um, and every night was very special. There was always something that was happening. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, photography uh, that we got from it, a lot of photos, a lot of video, uh, and a lot of time-lapse photography that we've, uh, we're kind of new to that we've been use utilizing. Um, but I have to, uh, you know, talk about one incident in particular where uh, after – meditation um, there was some basic types of language that we heard coming from the woods right and it started with a female voice and it was kind of some garble but it was word and then it 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 then escalated into uh, some some like yelping and cries uh, and it was very guttural and it was very deep. And uh, around this time, uh, during the meditation, uh, that we heard this a little bit after, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer actually got up and walked over to the forest uh, where this was taking place. And there was a, a few points that through the infrared night vision uh, goggles that we were utilizing and also through our uh, video system, it seemed that we could see a trillion different lights. And a lot of us could see these trillion sparkling lights of many different colors just in the space around us. It became uh, kind of a, a liquid state. And it was in the air, but it was very, uh, it was, it was covered in all these iridescent colors, is the best way I can put it. And at one point, uh, a craft was above us, and it came down in the form of a pentagon, um, and it landed right behind the circle, and Dr. Greer was uh, at one point communicating with some ETs, and he actually walked into this, this craft that was about 10 feet in diameter 
that had landed, and it was pure white. And he actually, you could actually see through him. He became transparent for a moment. And a couple of my other photographers on the team were asking me, um, I said to some of them, uh, one of my cameras started malfunctioning at one point, and I asked one of them to, you know, please get a, uh, a shot of Dr. Greer while I, you know, fix my camera for just a moment to change the settings. And she just looked up at me and she said, no, I'm sorry, I can't see him. And, you know, Dr. Greer was, you know, 15 feet in front of me. Right. So a lot of people started whispering behind me and as everyone was in this, this conscious state you know, with arms out and accepting uh, the ET's presence there, it was a very beautiful experience for a lot of the people there, that when this, the field of energy shifts at some point and your body becomes the same frequency as the craft that is near us or the entities that are there, you seem to get on the same level as they are, and sometimes you actually will um, start to dissolve through our normal eyes, you know, through our vision. You're there, but your 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 holographic image is now being uh, transcended into a different uh, dimension. And this has happened on many, many occasions on many different trips, but this one in particular because it was witnessed by 25 people. And we have it on film, and we have uh, also on photography uh, of this, you know, this whole thing unfolding. Um, after that, uh, Dr. Greer walked over to the side of the rock wall there, uh, on this on the edge of this beautiful national forest. Um, and it's kind of funny because uh, my plane was flying over this area on the way back home, and I actually could see the home that we stayed in, and I could see the forest behind it. And for, you know, maybe at least 100 miles or so, there was no buildings, there was no small cities, there was nothing out there in that neck of the woods, for sure, on the outskirts of Shasta. Um, and he walked up at this point to the rock wall where the forest starts behind the home. And a pyramid triangular black formation formed right on the black wall or right. about the size of a normal door doorway in your home and it was pitch black and it was seen not only by myself but by other people on the team and uh, have they commented on it later and this was from what I gather a portal that had opened up because of all the extraterrestrial contact that we were having and the elevated experience everyone was having at that time. And Dr. Greer's back is now towards me. And he turns, he had his hands out to his side, and he had his hands come up at about a 90 degree angle parallel to the ground. And I saw him reach in, just extend his arms through this black triangular hole. And the next thing that happened is I saw these arms come out and the arms were very thin and they were very long and they grasped these these hands um, which seemed to only have maybe three appendages on the end of them had grasped his forearms and then at that point he he just he moved for some reason or another and I couldn't see the rest I couldn't see what was happening after that I just saw the these long arms come out of this portal at that point, he stood there for another maybe 15 seconds, and he put his arms out to his side, and he turned completely, did an about face, and faced our cameras and faced myself. And now, you know, he's still about 25 feet away. And he had another set of arms connected to his torso below him. I know this sounds very bizarre, very strange. As but it should be. If it's easy, it's could, going to be strange, yeah. Yeah, it, it's something that, you know, you think you're prepared for until you see this. And he had bonded, and he had, he had bonded with this extraterrestrial on a different frequency and became one with this extraterrestrial and had shown 
through linear time some of the attributes of this extraterrestrial. And when he turned around, it looked like he was a Shiva. Uh, you know, or if you guys know what a Shiva is, I'm sure a lot of people in World Fuji know, that these beings um, in India that have, you know, maybe four, six, eight arms, and he had a duplicate set of arms, but not of his own coming out of his waistline. And then the arms slowly turned right back into his arms. So now, you know, for 20, 30 seconds, he ha now has four of his I mean, it looked like of his own body, of human form. And then they just dissolved away. And, a, and, and all of a sudden, there was this loud uh, clankety-clankety clatter up on the roof and a large thump. And it was like something had crashed into the roof and tumbled down the roof and jumped stable onto the ground like a giant thump. And this is no further than 10 feet from the group, and I think about 90% of the people heard it because right. a lot of people said to me, Emery, what was that? And I turned around and said, did you hear that? And uh, many of them acknowledged me as this was all going on. And immediately when that happened, you turned 45 degrees and you walked right to the corner of the house where this happened, and this giant shaft of light came from just within time and space and formed. And most people saw this white light. I saw the white light, but I also saw a being that was there, a very celestial, godlike being that was at least 15 feet tall or more. I want to say he was 18 feet because the roof of the house goes up, you know, you know, 15, 16 feet at least, and this being was as tall as that on the corner of the roof. And, you know, like I said, this was also not just me seeing this, other people were seeing this unfold. And at that point, Dr. Greer was communicating with this uh, being, this avatar. And it seemed that this avatar was in control of the entire unfolding of that evening. There was many different types of beings and races and different also levels of celestial beings and different levels of uh, extraterrestrials that were there that were being controlled in, in, in this beautiful uh, unfolding of this orchestra, I want to say. It was, it was just so well orchestrated where these eight crafts flew in at the beginning and we were signaling back and forth with the lasers and then we went into meditation and this whole experience unfolded. And at one point, during the time where all these scintillating lights are everywhere, we're talking many different speckles of light in the air right in front of you, like liquid. And I know Dr. Greer will get into the liquid part in a little bit because his experience uh, that, that he gets into was at one point with an ET from a liquid world. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. And and I think that's why we were all thought we're in this liquidy space. Um, and I want to jump back. You know, so much was going on during this hour. Uh, I want to jump back to the point where the ET, um, at one point during that portal where the arms came out, and when he turned around and he had these four arms, there was an overlay of this extraterrestrial through my through the, the, your normal vision that was blue and what I saw was a blue a taller extraterrestrial and dr. Greer's a very tall man uh, he's you know 235 pounds and you know six foot three or six foot five so he's, he's big and this ET was another 24 inches or 18 inches taller than him and what I noticed is that this blue extraterrestrial that he was communicating with and bonding with was very similar to an extraterrestrial that I met the day before during a very, very deep meditation where I was astrally projected um, out of my body and was floating through our solar system uh, with other extraterrestrials that were by my side. They were escorts, actually, sentinel beings from uh, Arcturus that I've seen before. 
and they were they wanted to show me something, and there was this craft that was I want to say maybe 50 to 75 miles long. I mean, it was just huge. It could have been longer. And we were going near this craft, and I've seen this craft in meditation before, and it was out by Saturn, right, in the, in the Saturn ring. But this time, it was much closer. And this is where the orchestrated events were being uh, broadcasted from, and this is where, when that light beam came down at the corner of the house, he was he was holographically image projected from this craft. So everything that we were seeing was more of a holographic image. There were some times where things did manifest into material form where you could touch it. But for the most part, what I saw was a more of a translucent, uh, interdimensional uh, vision of, you know, all these things that were floating around us. Anyway, so as I was going out through the solar system and and noticed that the ship was closer, I felt the joy, happiness of all the different beings and races that were in this craft. And they were very, very busy. And they were very attentive. And they were they were very serious. At, but at the same time, there was a celebration going on. And it seemed like they were preparing for something. Right. And this preparation is one of the biggest, largest events that our universe has ever seen because it's not only happening in our solar system, it's happening in trillions of solar systems all around. And what happens here is also happening in other places at different levels. So the whole orchestrated effect of the solar system and the universe of this planned effort of these extraterrestrials that are out there are basically going to are basically um, going to, at the same time, all around, initiate contact. And I feel that that is going to be very soon. I don't right. know a date, a time. That, that's not realistic to me. But I just felt that the fact that they have came closer with this craft, that I know why they stayed out there for so long is because our scale, our weapons, and technology could possibly destroy them. But something is happening here on Earth that people are changing. Yeah, and, and that's want. what we're doing. I mean, we have to prepare the planet for the fact that we're 100 years into a whole new yuga or a big cycle that's a 500,000-year cycle, and it's a universal cycle. It's not just an Earth cycle. A lot of people talk about the Mayan calendar, which was, you know, had these dates of 2012, but that's a small cycle within a larger cycle, and it's the end of one large era. That was a, a, a Vedic cycle of about 450,000 years, but now we're opening up another 500,000-year cycle, the hallmark of which is universal contact and universal peace. And so uh, this is really what this whole new period is about in higher states of consciousness. And uh, I want to comment on, you know, these scintillating lights. Actually, uh, Emory got a photograph of it. And the photograph is amazing because superimposed on the view of the foreground and the mountain and, and the, the hill behind us where the National Forest was are all these trillions of brilliantly colored blue and green and red and uh every kind of color you can imagine, light. And that's what we were moving in. And when I was having this contact experience with this ET, it was as if I could, <coughs> excuse me, I could see his head, I could see his whole uh, body, but it was a very thin, long being, but was in this sort of substrate or, or, or material that was a, kind of like a fluid. And it was alive. And it wasn't just like water. It was a living fluid. And I realized that this being was from a world that was very much a uh, nutrient-fluid world, very different from our world. And this is a being I had never seen before, actually, or, or species I had never seen before. And what I was told is that it was a very, very highly evolved being, um, but that many of these civilizations are being introduced to humanity now, and that now that there are literally thousands of people doing these contact protocols all over the world, that it, there's a morphogenic field that's being manifested that supports this kind of more ex 
explicit open contact. And so some of this is actually in the photographs. Some of them were some of it was too subtle to get on photography. Um, and what people have to understand is that if you're a civilization that goes from one star system or one galaxy to another, all of your technologies uh, require trans-dimensional or interdimensional uh, capabilities, and those are ones that are based in the science of consciousness. And those people who, of course, everyone at the World Puja Network understands the science of consciousness and mind, and also the Vedic uh, cities. Uh, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, capabilities and powers that include bilocation, uh, trilocation, teleportation. And if you want to visualize it, it's as if you could have a civilization with a material sort of nuts and bolts, although they don't use nuts and bolts, uh, spacecraft out in deep space, say out by Saturn, and there could be the entire contingent of those occupants uh, transdimensionally, electronically, projected like an electronic astral projection onto a site and that's what was happening and we were seeing some of the evidences of that many people were seeing various components of this and um, the way it did kick off was a fully materialized group of beings that were making these sounds in the forest behind us which no one in the group had ever heard before it was very atavistic um, it was almost like a, a primitive Sort of connection, and I got the sense that there were there were beings that had manifested from the past that had been on Earth millions of years ago that had evolved to become interstellar and left this planet and had come back because the past and the present and the future were kind of all coming together in this transdimensional event that's out of space time as we normally think of it, and uh, it was really quite quite beautiful, although aspects of it rather, as Emery said, rather strange and bizarre, but of course you would expect it to be that. And uh, it, it was, however, guided by this very high consciousness of celestial uh, being that was present that was visible very much to my naked eye that came, was shimmering there by the side of the house. And um, this is the sort of event actually that happened every night, and it kept on all week. Uh, one of the things that happened from the first night we arrived at the house, we were out on this, uh, it's this giant log structure up on the edge of the National Forest, and there were these luminous craft that came out of the side of the volcano, Mount Shasta, way up near the top, up in an area that's a vertical glacier and landslide area where no humans could possibly be. And were there the very first night that we came out onto the deck, and in fact, uh, a craft then came up above the uh, Mount Shasta, and uh, a member of our team, Clark, uh, who's a, a UCSB engineering graduate who, who works in Silicon Valley, he uh, and I stepped out on the, the deck of this big log house, and this object signaled to us three times uh, right above the mountain, massive uh, discharge. And so throughout the week, we had... Uh, this ET I call kindness, her craft appear, and these beautiful golden craft that would appear right above us. And I'm quite sure we got these filmed because yes, uh, yeah, we we're using a new filming system. Uh, it's experimental, but basically it's a um, two cameras that are facing with this eye lens straight up, getting 360 degrees of the sky and the terrain. And it's a it's on a setting, so it looks like color night vision basically but it's basically taking a photograph every five seconds and then we're stitching them together in a uh, what looks like a video and, and actually Emery and, and our arm Kalika kind of figured out how to do this and this is the first expedition where we tried it now the, 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 that's the good news the bad news is that we literally have tens of thousands of frames that someone's going to have to go through frame by frame to find all of these images but we did have uh, this uh, em engineering uh, graduate who was very, very meticulous, who was making a log as people would see different objects that would materialize above us or in the field, and then he would write down the time and the, the location, if it was in the northeast at 30 degrees or wherever it was. And so, you know, but this is the sort of thing we're doing, and some of this will certainly make its way into the film series. Oh, yes. 
Absolutely. We have a lot of good footage and a lot of good things that have happened that we're going to be able to use, and we had a really great group of people. Um, I would like to uh, touch on one other thing um, to get back to the story. I want to finish. Um, as I was, you know, being projected past this craft and saw this craft and saw what was going on, I was then shown uh, another space, another area of space. It was completely blue. It was the most beautiful blue I've ever seen. Right. And these extraterrestrials were taking me to the, this space, this, this area. They, they, they wanted to show me something. They said, you have to see this. They kept telling me, you know, you have to, you have to experience this was the message. And as we were going through, you know, this, this different part of space, and everything was blue without stars. That was the next scene. There was this uh, almond-shaped area in the sky. And we started getting closer to this almond-shaped area, and in the middle of this almond-shaped area seemed this, this black hole. And they started, we just started flying towards this black hole. And the next thing I noticed was I just, what you can normally see with your eyes, you just see what's in front of you. And then all of a sudden, that black hole and this almond-shaped area around it blinked, and it was the eye of a, of a very, very large extraterrestrial. And what that meant was here I am in this gigantic craft with these extraterrestrials, and the pinpoint of our craft could fit in the entire pupil of this extraterrestrial. And I was shown immediately the size of these beings. And it, it was a macro, microcosm type of effect where it was showing me an area of space that the avatar beings live. And uh, yeah, the divine avatar, the, the, the divine the, avatar. Yeah, right, right. And the reason I wanted to tell you this story is because going back to when you came out and you had the superimposed extraterrestrial in front of that black pyramid portal of rock, for a moment there at least, let's say, about a minute, you had this blue being that was superimposed on you that had this long conical head. And if you can picture an octopus, um, one of the octopus arms with the suction cups, take the suction cups off, and where the head, conical head comes up, put one of those octopus arms, and then coil it up really nice and tight and put it on the head, this is the being that I saw with these these ears that were kind of phalanged like a like a fish fin. They were they were very large and they were like kind of like a like a fin, the ears. And they had this it was very beautiful. And I said to myself, Wow, this is the same being that I saw the, the you know, the day before during the meditation. Right. And then after this when you described that this being was from a water planet everything made sense to me again right and it all just everything that's what's neat about these expeditions is that you get bits and pieces during each night and towards the middle and the end it all comes together in a big beautiful story of how it all unfolds and not only do I put my input into it but each individual in the circle actually something will happen to them it might be very strange or bizarre but we, we encourage everyone to share everything because when you put everything together, there's the aha moment. Right, and that's what they're testing. They want to see people operating with enough trust and openness to share all of these experiences and both thought and consciousness, but also what they're seeing physically and experiencing physically because uh, many times uh, people will think, well, this is just too bizarre. It can't be happening, and yet it is. And I think that this is because the nature of life in the universe is enormously diverse, and yet there's this central uh, operating system, I call it, of, of pure consciousness and higher consciousness, uh, the non-local, infinite, omnipresent aspect of consciousness that is actually at the heart of this entire experience. And that's why you know, every single night we do, actually we do a puja <laughs> on the World Puja Network, and I do it in Sanskrit, of course, and, and we do we start the night with a, a very deep meditation that's in silence, and then I do a guided meditation to bring everyone into a higher state of consciousness. 
And almost invariably, uh, as we go into that process, there are these sorts of unfolding experiences. I mean, what Emory's been sharing is one of uh, several dozen that happened in the course of this week, actually. And uh, I want to share another thing that happened that was really quite remarkable towards um, the end of the week. We went up uh, onto the mountain during the daytime because uh, this particular week it was very, very hot in Mount Shasta. It was getting up to 100 degrees even in town. So we went up on the mountain at about uh, just under 7,000 feet altitude and um, would have a sort of forest academy, as it's called in the Vedic literature, where we sit out under the uh, trees up um, at this high place called Sand Flats. And while we were there, um, we were doing um, our afternoon sharing and remote view training and, and discussions. And there was this extraordinary sound that emanated from the earth and the sky that was like a rolling thunder. Now, it wasn't an earthquake, and it wasn't thunder, and it wasn't a jet. It was a nothing man-made. And it was the ETs that are in the mountain, in Mount Shasta, letting us know their presence. And it was after that that a lot of this really picked up. And in fact, while we were there, we have these magnetometers, and I, uh, the magnetic field meters uh, pick up changes the magnetic field. And these are devices that if you say take them over to a refrigerator or a microwave would just squeal as it got closer to the source of, a, of the magnetic field of the motor that's in that uh, appliance. However, we're out in the middle of nowhere and literally in the National Forest, uh, millions of acres up around Mount Shasta. And suddenly, uh, as we began to talk about specifically the ETs that were in the mountain that are these ancient ones yeah. have been there since uh, the continents out in the Pacific, uh, Lemuria and Mu and these other continents that existed. It began to do this song. The magnetometer began to do it. Wasn't, it's like an orchestra. It's melodic. It's not like it does when you take it near a man-made electromagnetic motor. And when I started talking about this little uh, ET being that we're investigating or to, 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 that, that we have photos of, uh, it began to really get excited, and then we felt that civilization's people come in. And there was all this contact, and this is in broad daylight, happening up on the mountain. But everyone, of course, there are a few people who kind of said, oh, my God, what is that sound? Because it was actually rumbling the air and rumbling the earth and rumbling all around us. But it wasn't the mountain. It was something transdimensional and uh, quite amazing. And that night when we got back down to, and so we're doing our protocols, um, part of what we do, and, and this began really intensely with this particular species of ETs and Emory and me, and we've talked about this before, uh, these very tall, you know, nine to 12 foot tall uh, beings that uh, we think are from the Arcturus star system or out in that sector of space. Um, and with the magnetometer began to light up as we took it from our, our sacral uh, chakra and then to our heart. And it was connected really strongly from my heart as it was as I was connecting to Emery's heart. And it was this it was this pattern. It was like a spiraling vortex pattern where again we got the sense that it was doing some kind of transdimensional work on the level of our astral bodies as they manifest the physical bodies at that point of the DNA double helix. And there was amazing effects that we had. I mean, it was very, very powerful. And this was the evening after we had been up on the mountain during the day where these strange rumbling and uh, uh, sounds coming from the air all around us uh, were reverberating for, for quite some time. Uh, what I felt was that there was this deep connection that came from the mountain that activated um, an, uh, an opening into that dimension because we had not had these magnetometers doing anything all week until all week there was nothing yeah nothing until this this day and it, it continued to increase like that uh, until the final night um, which I guess was Friday night which was incredibly intense awesome. and on that particular night uh, I was actually I went and took a break and walked around behind this massive log house it's an 8,000 square foot log lodge that's just this thing amazing structure um, that's surrounded on three sides by National Forest. And we were up there at this place, and I was just as I was uh, heading back to the group, there was this kind of soft flash of light 
in front of me against the same rock wall and where the forest is. But then as I approached the group, I stepped into, uh, with my right leg, this brilliant discharge of a, about a four-foot sphere of celestial white light uh, that is, it was pure white light. and It was that, brighter than a flash bulb. Yeah, it was brighter than a flash on a camera, on a correct. standard camera. Right. So if, if you can imagine in thin air, if, a, if someone was there with a, a, a bright flash from a camera going off, but there's no one around us, that's what the energy, but it was celestial energy. It was conscious light, and that conscious light had within it uh, knowledge and love and uh, energy, and it was very highly energetic. And a member of our team from uh, British Columbia who was there, uh, Deb Warren, was looking right at it when it happened, and she could not believe what she saw. And subsequently, we brought a few other people around, came came around, of course, and uh, Jack Ullman, who does a lot of our video editing and, and night photography with the night scope, uh, had a smaller version of this light up right in front of him. And so these celestial ET beings were coming in in these uh, spheres of light, and then, even if the naked eye didn't see anything, they were there in consciousness. And so what I point out to people, a lot of times people will actually see with their naked eye, probably not something that extraordinary, but even a, a smaller orb or what have you. But within that is the conscious essences and energies of an extraterrestrial civilization because they don't always have to come with a craft that's fully materialized in three-dimensional space-time. In fact, given the fact that the world has become an armed camp with classified weapons that are these very high-tech electromagnetic pulse-type weapons that are longitudinal scalar weapons that go faster than the speed of light, we, we understand that the ETs frequently will do this because it's much safer, but it's quite visible. But then what you have to do is in remote view go into deep consciousness and see that within that energy field of light are multiple beings from different civilizations that are there in, as a ambassador greeting party to us because that's what this whole project is about. It's about our cultures coming together. Now, many people ask me, you know, what's being said and, you know, is there any messages and I, to which I'd say yes. I mean, it's volumes and books. And But the, the key thing is the connection. It's being in that state of oneness together and understanding that this is the time for humanity to realize that we've never been alone. Uh, but now we're going to be knowing this all together and moving into an era of uh, world peace and universal peace and contact. And it, to give you an idea, in the next few hundred years to maybe a thousand years, every planet in the cosmos and the universe is going to be united. Now that's a very short amount of time. And that's what's beginning. So this this process is what we have to have pioneers doing it. and that's why it's so important for people to understand the transdimensional nature of reality the conscious nature of reality and understand that these protocols the reason they work is because we're not just staying locked in linear space time which is a part of reality but the larger reality are these other dimensions and that the state of consciousness and conscious thought and and conscious visualization and, of course, the, the central one is unbounded, pure mind, the samadhi state. And so that when you experience this and you're out under the stars with a group of people with this sort of pure intent, uh, it, it's amazing the level of contact that happens. And we have teams all over the world doing this. Um, in fact, uh, that one of the nights we were there, the last night we were there, there was a global CE5 initiative, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is what we call this, is when humans initiate and welcome contact. Um, that there was a global CE5 initiative going on, and there were something like 54 teams in 14 countries around the world that were doing it during that same time. And that's when this brilliant object came in and appeared right beside me. But it was interesting, symbolically, it was as my right foot stepped into that spot. And right symbolizes future, and I was walking into it, and it was a very good sign about moving forward with everything we're working on. I just felt that it was a message. Even the way that it unfolded, there, had, there was a, a metaphor and a message within it. And um, 
very, very beautiful. And I think that it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it, it was it was escalating, you know, at that point and and before that, to the point where I really thought there was going to be something larger than what we're used to happening, and that's saying a lot. Right. And and right when all this was escalating to a point where the energy in the air was just so intense. I mean, not to sound funny, but just like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind over Devil's Tower where this giant cloud moved in right, and took up exactly half of the sky with a defined, perfectly straight line, which we have on video. And behind that cloud, these weird, bright, white flashes going on and off where Dr. Greer got everyone together to, and sat in meditation and... And the sky started clearing above us. And then we started feeling droplets of water upon our bodies and face while looking up. And there was no cloud above us at that point. Right. And it was this anointing and this purification. And it was the, you know, the essence of all that is good that is out there that was happening at the time, and you can elaborate more on that, I'm sure. Well, every single person felt that, and this had happened one other time when we were in Crestone a couple years ago where we were on a site, and it was crystal clear, and I realized that there were extraterrestrial craft in under the earth within these giant aquifers that are in the San Luis Valley, and I began to speak of this in meditation from the point of view of celestial perception and higher consciousness, and at that instant, there was this silky type of uh, liquid that fell on everyone and everyone felt it was like an anointing and a blessing well the same thing happened at Mount Shasta and the sky you look straight up and it was stars uh, and it had been very very dry and what was interesting is that it happened in the meditation just at a similar point as it had in Creston, in Creston Colorado a few years ago and so you get these interactions between higher consciousness Gaia which is of course a conscious living being the earth and these extraterrestrial civilizations and the spirit beings and all of this comes together in this beautiful cosmology as I call it and I wrote a paper some years ago called Extraterrestrials in the New Cosmology which is in one of my books I can't remember which one but um, that describes this beautiful integration that's in a conscious quantum hologram that is the universe that is awake that involves multiple uh, dimensions transdimensional and that involves not just extraterrestrial civilizations but the celestial beings and how consciousness interfaces with that and the earth being and this is why we have so many extraordinary things that happen in nature um, that are unique and amazing because everyone you know I mean of course the native peoples understood this but the earth herself is a conscious being and it's not just rocks and dead matter. It's actually conscious living material. And this state of unity consciousness where all this is that, where you actually begin to experience everything as a conscious living reality, really comes full bore, but begins to manifest in ways that are tangible and miraculous and amazing and beautiful on these expeditions. And this is why people, um, you know, when they come on these expeditions, you know, some people think, well, we're going to go and, you know, kick the tires on a UFO or something. But it's actually it's that sometimes. But it's more about this state of consciousness because if, if a civilization has attained interstellar travel capabilities, they've had to master all of these cities. There's no way you can go from one galaxy or one star system to another within linear space-time. And once you go past the crossing point of light, you've entered into increasingly conscious dimensions where the operating paradigm is the science of consciousness. And this is why the science of consciousness is the big science of the next thousand years. You know, free energy, anti-gravity, lifter systems, all this is a thing. All these are things that have developed between the, the late 1800s and the mid-1900s. By 1950, we had all that. It's just the fact that the public doesn't know about it. Meanwhile, we're destroying the planet because of this outrageous and criminal secrecy. But the, the real thrust that, we, that, that, <laughs> that motivates and that moves everything along is this 
understanding of a higher state of consciousness and a spiritual state of consciousness. And in fact, that's what has to dawn on this planet in full blossom in order for us even to use these new technologies and sciences appropriately. Because otherwise, if we use these new sciences from the consciousness of destruction and warfare, which is how we're using everything else that we have today, then it just makes matters worse. So there, there's this whole transformative process that has to place, but at the core of it is the evolution of higher states of consciousness, spiritual awareness, and peace, because without that, there can be no progress. We've reached the point where going into any further technological development without peace is, a, is not a possibility, and anyone who contemplates this matter knows that. And that's why the big challenge of our time is this deep transformation of life on Earth that begins inside and within consciousness. And so uh, that's really the core of, of what we're doing. So um, I, we're about to run out of time. My God, I can't believe it's been an hour. I want to oh, wow. remind people that we have a um, big event coming up. Those of you in the Southern California area, on September 16th, at the uh, Broad Street Theater in Santa Monica, California. I'm going to be making a presentation, which I hope will be a tour de force of this subject, um, and it's open to the public. And it's going to become, it's going to be the base thread that weaves the entire serious movie together. And it's going to be professionally filmed in this really beautiful high-tech theater there in Santa Monica. So if you want to come to that, um, you can find out about uh, the, the time and the date is September 16th at 7 o'clock at the Broad Street Theater in Santa Monica, California. And the information is at serious.neverendinglight.com. And you're very welcome to attend. I hope everyone who can come will come. There's there's apparently parking on site. It's a very, very nice facility, very high-tech. We're going to have amazing photos, videos, gra uh, and images that we will put together. And uh, I'm going to cover... In, in two hours, but well as I can, uh, all of the, the, the core information of disclosure, our contact experiences, transdimensional sciences, and the new energy uh, systems that involve free energy and anti-gravity um, in this presentation. So I hope many of you will be able to come, those of you who are in that part of the United States. So um, that will be coming up on September 16th. I also want to mention that uh, in November, if you go to CSETI.org, we are going to have another one of these expeditions uh, under the stars uh, in uh, the Anza Borrega State Park. It's a 700,000-acre uh, wilderness in Southern California. And um, those of you who would like to come to that, uh, you can find out information about that at CSETI.org. So, uh, until next time, thank you, Emery, for sharing all of your insights and all of your help and great expertise. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Many blessings. Yeah, and to everyone at the World Puja Network, I'd like to thank you for hosting us here every uh, couple of weeks. And until next time, I keep looking up. This has been uh, Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. And until the next show, uh, stay in universal peace. And I hope to see you soon there.